Welcome, and thank you for joining me as I share my story, Making a New Friend, Virtual versus JSON. I am Heather McHugh of Harmonic Software Production Studios. My professional title is Lead FileMaker Developer for Dallas-based Claris Platinum Partner, Harmonic Software Production Studios, where I'm proud to be part of an amazing team of talent. Harmonic has been my home for the past 15 years, but my journey as a developer actually began when I was introduced to Claris FileMaker 2 over three decades ago. I am certified in FileMaker versions 7 through 18, and I'm probably best known for my expertise in regulated environments like HIPAA, but I also participated in the 2016 FileMaker Developer Challenge, where I had the unexpected thrill and honor of being on the winning design team. When I'm not developing, I'm an avid cake decorator and grandmother of seven. I also enjoy playing backgammon in the round and collecting Depression-era ruby, a perfect fit since we converted our living room into an Irish pub. But long before any of my current interests, I was a scout, and I remain a scout at heart, which is relevant to this session because as a scout, I was taught to make new friends but keep the old because one is silver, the other is gold. I believe that just as we form friendships with people that we admire and trust, we have a similar tendency to bond with the tools and techniques that we trust. They've served us well, so when faced with a new challenge, we turn first to our trusted favorites. They've earned their position as a priority choice. We know them well, we understand them, and we have confidence in their abilities. But sometimes, in order to choose the most appropriate approach, we need to check our bias and rethink our options. So enough with introductions and philosophy, it's time for our story. For those who may be unfamiliar, in chapter one, I will introduce you to the virtual list, what it is, how it works, and why he's been such a good friend to me and countless other developers. Next, I will share in chapter two, why virtual list was a great choice and how we implemented it to support a particularly unique and challenging set of requirements. I will introduce you to my new friend JSON in chapter three, sharing how JSON allows us to redefine the structure and organization of our data, talk natively to APIs, and so much more. In chapter four, I will share with you how the passage of time revealed a flaw in our virtual list solution and why we chose to replace it with JSON. Chapter 5 concludes our story with under the hood details of the effort involved to re-engineer the solution using JSON and of course the successful results. Supplementing the story is an appendix with additional examples showcasing JSON's versatility and examples of how VirtualList remains a good friend and continues to support us. Chapter one, introducing my good friend, Virtualist the Magician. I like to think of the Virtualist as a classic magician, often transforming complex, even unrelated data sets with flexibility and ease. Best known for its flexibility and usefulness with reporting, Virtualist is a technique introduced by Bruce Robertson circa 2009, whereby the power of variables is employed to overcome a variety of traditional obstacles. For those who are unfamiliar with the technique, I will explain the concept and share some options and tips. I will also share examples illustrating the versatility and functionality that has proven this magician time and again to be a trustworthy and dependable friend. At its core, the Virtualist technique uses three simple components. First, you will set the values you intend to use into variables. The values themselves can come from virtually anywhere hence the virtual. In this example, I'm using FileMaker's list function to set my variable with a list of colors, red, white, and blue. A virtual list table of otherwise blank records will serve as the context for your report, with each record representing a specific row. Then using getRecordNumber to determine its position, unstored calculation fields in the virtual list table simply pull the correct variable value belonging to their respective row on the report. In the example from our super simple recap, we gathered multiple values into a return delimited list from which our unstored calcs pulled their data using getValue. Record 1 looks for and returns the first value from our variable, which was red. Record 2 then returns the second value, and so on. This model works well for most scenarios, 
but not for all. So an alternate model can also be used, capturing each row's value into its own variable repetition. This is essentially the same in that each row will pull the correct value based on the virtual list's record number. The difference is that the repetition model won't break if the value for a specific row is missing or includes returns. The repetition model is also more performant, something you'll want to keep in mind when using virtual lists to generate long reports. I've turned to my friend the virtual list on many occasions. Variables are at the heart of the virtual list, and because I'm in control of defining the variables, I'm able to pivot values or combine data from different contexts. And I can do this entirely within my scripting. Because the virtual list calculations are looking at variables for their values, the same fields and layouts can readily support multiple different reports. If you capture a row type as one of your values, you can even combine this with conditional formatting to produce non-traditional subsummaries and dividers. As a temporary data store, the virtual list model provides other functional options as well. I've used it for data transfer, and I've used related models to deliver dynamic portal sorting and schema-independent dynamic value lists. The virtual list's proven ability to accommodate unique requirements has certainly earned my confidence. Here are a few tips to keep in mind or get you thinking. First, remember to choose the right tool for each implementation. It is possible to use local variables, but it's a rare virtual list occasion that warrants using local over global variables. If you don't clear your global variables when you're finished, you run the risk of overlapping values from one run to the next. You might be surprised to learn that although your virtual list results are unstored, they can actually be treated pretty much like any other field. That said, if you do want to provide interactive reports with sort options, your calcs cannot be dependent on get record number. Referencing a stored serial number instead will allow you to sort without issue. You can alter your virtual list calcs as needed to meet more unique requirements. Our case study in Chapter 2, for example, employs repeating virtual list fields. Images can be set into variables for use by any unstored calc, including virtual list fields. Just keep in mind that return to limited values won't work with binary data. Last but not least, a word about field names. Unlike other tables where you would expect descriptive field names such as name first and name last, virtual list fields tend to be named with more flexibility in mind. Now, I'm all for repurposing existing objects, but over time, I've found that the vagueness of generically named fields like text01 and text02 creates unnecessary confusion. Since overhead is minimal for these unstored calcs in your virtual list table, I often prefer to use report-specific fields, and I find them even easier to work with when a field name matches the variable that it uses. I've included an example of this for you in the appendix and demo file. Chapter 2. Our case study will share why virtual list was the right choice for a particularly unique and challenging set of requirements. Our client, Independent Support Services, or ISS, is a leading fiscal intermediary nonprofit agency in New York. They provide administrative support to the developmentally disabled population who are self-directing. For a person with a developmental disability, self-direction means being able to have real control over their life. Our story begins with Casey, a woeful billing clerk who dreaded preparing the monthly state billing documents that were required in order for ISS to be reimbursed for the hundreds of thousands of dollars they'd paid out on behalf of their program participants for state-covered expenditures. Thanks to the unique requirements for state billing claims, you could find poor Casey chained to her desk each month with a typewriter, adding machine, and an ever-growing stack of paper until each of hundreds of individual rows had been filled out and the pages could finally be placed into their manila envelope for mailing. Phew. Before I go any further, let me first provide some context and background. The individuals served by ISS are participants who have chosen the path of self-directed services rather than accepting an available slot in a more traditional congregate program where opportunities to explore their interests and be part of their communities may be limited. Self-direction budgets are specific to the needs of each participant, and each budget consists of multiple budget lines, each with their own approved amount. 
As the fiscal intermediary, ISS is responsible for managing each participant's budget, which includes paying for expenses that are covered by their budgets. For the funds that they've paid out on behalf of participants, ISS submits claims for reimbursement. Some budget lines are covered by Medicaid, and ISS submits claims electronically for these. The remaining budget lines are reimbursed by the Office for Persons with Developmental Disabilities, OPWDD. So why was this such a laborious task, and why in this day and age was Casey reduced to using a typewriter and adding machine? Well, Submitting a reimbursement claim to the OPWDD required using a form whose last version was, get this, June of 1994. Of course, claims that don't comply with the form's requirements simply will not be paid. So what was it about the requirements that made this such an arduous and manual task? Let's take a look. Each submission to the state requires a cover page. And because it's possible for a submission to include claims from different months, the total for each included month must be listed on the cover page along with the grand total, of course. Now, if you're thinking this doesn't look so challenging and that we could have generated this report with a traditional subsummary report, you're absolutely right. The devil was in the detail, the detailed pages, that is. First off, the form specifies only five permissible service indicator codes, and not all of these correlate directly to participant budgets, which can include up to seven state reimbursable bill types. This means that claim amounts for the bill types of housing subsidy, family reimbursed respite, and OTPS would have to be merged into a single BSSD coded row. Our next challenge was the form's physical limitation of just nine rows per page. Now, would this have been possible with a traditional report? Sure. Would it have been simple? No. Each detail page was also required to have its own individual total. Could this have been accomplished with a traditional report? Not easily. And finally, the requirement that all the rows on a detail page must belong to the same month. If ISS were to submit claims for both September and October, but the September claims end on row 7, like our example here, rows 8 and 9 must remain blank, with October's claim rows beginning on the next page. Easy peasy, right? <laughs> Wrong. If ever there was a time to call on my friend the virtual list, this was it. To explain our model for the detail pages, I'll use the bill amount column as my example. Perhaps the most notable detail about this implementation of virtual list was our use of repeating fields. This ensured absolute conformity to the physical parameters of each form. Each field repetition pulled from the applicable repetition of our global variable. With each virtual list record representing a specific page of the report, the page level totals for the unit and amount columns were obtained with simple calculations summing the repeating field. On the cover page, we also used repeating fields, here for the month-specific values. Again, this provided a level of control that record-based rows could not. The calc behind our monthly sums column actually used Execute SQL to return a sum of the page level totals for each month represented among our virtual list records. The values being summed were themselves unstored and being pulled from variables, so you might expect this to have been slow, but I can assure you it was not. Our grand total was a simple summary of our detail page totals. Here's the actual detail page layout, and here's the actual cover page layout. They look pretty darn simple now, don't they? Now that you've seen how our report displayed the data, let's take a look at how the data was gathered. After locating and sorting the desired found set of claims, our build script looped through each record where a series of type-specific tests were performed to determine the correct codes and to combine types that needed to be merged. Within the loop, rows were assigned by incrementing the R variable. And if you're wondering how this worked given our destination of repeating fields, I'll get to that one in just a moment. The applicable service indicator code was then set along with the remaining row-specific values. Because data was stored in variable repetitions, of which there were hundreds, the individual field repetitions needed to calculate their correct source for each row of their record's specific report page. Rows 1 through 9 were simple, of course, but from which variable reps 
would the same rows on page 2 or page 12 be pulled? Let's break it down. Now, in our setup here, the CID field is a unique serial number to each record. So with each virtual list record representing a specific detail page, the let statement determined which rep to use by first determining on which increment of 9 the preceding page ended. To this value, it then simply added its own repetition number. The repetitions belonging on page 1, pulled from variable reps 1 through 9, while the repetitions on page 2 pulled from variable reps 10 through 19, and so on. Page-specific details, including sums, were calculated separately. Our story ends with Casey, our now cheerful billing clerk, able to generate the monthly state billing with ease. No typewriter or adding machine required. Having achieved success, both virtual and literal, I was, once again, quite pleased with my friend the virtualist. Chapter 3, Introducing My New Friend, JSON, A Superhero. JSON, which stands for JavaScript Object Notation, is a lightweight, language-independent, easy-to-write, human-readable format for structuring data that's quickly becoming the default format for data exchange on the Internet. So how does JSON work? JSON is essentially an organized string of text, so it doesn't actively do anything. The true power of JSON lies entirely in what you do with it, how you choose to use it. FileMaker provides us with a core tool set of native functions that enable us to parse and modify JSON data from other sources and from our own design. But these are simply the starting point. They are building blocks, because what FileMaker gives us is an incredibly flexible and powerful procedural scripting engine, custom function mechanism, and other tools. So it's completely within our power to expand and customize our tool set, using those building blocks to do all kinds of magical things with JSON. Why I use JSON can best be explained with a recap of what JSON gives us in the abstract. Because you define the structure, it's infinitely flexible. As a text string, it's easily stored and easy to share. As an easy-to-parse text string, JSON also gives us the ability to talk natively to most modern APIs. It's also an excellent messenger to inform and teach your own external systems. JSON can be very performant, in large part because we're able to eliminate traditional schema. As an example, if I were to take months of invoices with lines and payments that might be spread across three or four or even five tables, and I need to extract information out of those, Using traditional FileMaker, I might have to retrieve and move to the client hundreds or even thousands of rows. And as we know with FileMaker, when we move a row, we move every field in that row. With JSON, we can store the parts of that data that we need for whatever this action or report or process is, and it can live in literally one record. So I only need to move one row to access potentially thousands of data points instead of moving thousands of rows. During a recent interview with Steve Sikora, president of Harmonic Software Production Studios, he summed up my own experience with JSON perfectly when he said, it just keeps giving and giving. This simple audit log illustrates some basic JSON formatting. This short string of JSON contains the details from a single transaction. In this version of the same string, I'm showing the data labels in gray and the data points in blue, so you can identify the details more clearly. Using the FileMaker function, JSON Format Elements, makes our string even easier to read. Our second JSON string contains an accumulation of details from multiple transactions. Clearly, longer and more complex text strings are not as easy to read at a glance. When formatted, it's easier to see that our JSON string contains the detail from five separate transactions. Notice, however, that not every entry includes the same data points. This illustrates JSON's flexibility. To further illustrate the flexibility and value of JSON, I'm sharing an actual audit log that we use to track status changes in an expense table. From receipt to payment, multiple users might interact with an expense, and when something isn't as expected, the client wants to know why, as in who did what when. 
In our first edit node, we can clearly see that this record was added via the web, and that it was then processed by Jay Johnson, who placed it on hold just a few minutes later. Over a month later, the same user cleared the hold and added it to a batch for payment, then it was picked up just a few seconds later by the server-side validation script. Notice here that the script schedule's name, Expense Validations, is returned as the user. The validation script found an error and returned it for further review. The status progression here is easy to follow, and the relevant details are readily discernible. Let's take a look now at how this JSON audit log was built. The field containing the JSON-based audit log is a text field with an auto-enter calc set to always evaluate. The calc uses a let statement to define what details to include in the JSON, and the evaluate function to trigger an update when either of the two designated fields is modified, including if one of the fields is cleared, which is why I prefer using evaluate rather than including these fields as triggers in my let statement. Within the let, I first defined an address for the node that will hold the new entry. For readability and an easy-to-follow sequence, I use a modified timestamp that ensures they end up in alphabetical order. For each data point, I've specified both the label and data values. There's no need to include empty placeholders for data points that don't exist, so the script and parameter objects are populated only when applicable. I was pretty excited by the success of my status audit log and the ability to easily define highly customized variations for use elsewhere, but the possibilities with JSON far exceed what you're likely to find in an audit trail. There's much that can be done using JSON, and now that you've seen some examples of basic JSON structure, I want to show you where we at Harmonic have found JSON to be the most valuable. My audit log examples populated local fields with locally available data values. However, much like the virtual list, JSON can contain data from multiple sources. It contains whatever you've defined it to contain, and more importantly, it will organize the data as you've defined it, irrespective of the original source. I could have, for example, chosen to organize my audit log not by timestamp, but by account. You might also notice that in this abbreviated history, I've chosen to only collect the user when it differs from the account. Being able to organize allows you to not only combine data points from multiple contexts, something you can also achieve with virtual list, it allows you to effectively redefine the data structure without modifying your schema. We saw how the status audit log grouped data based on a timestamp, which makes perfect sense when what you're collecting is a history of sequential events. But how else and why else might we want to reorganize data that is otherwise well normalized? Simple and temporary use examples, like pivoting data for a report, can often be readily achieved using a virtual list. But what if we need to permanently pivot our data for reference by a web viewer or a custom web page, for example? Perhaps we want to move certain data points closer for quicker local reference, or we may need to access a combined set of values for which context is an issue. I know this all sounds pretty abstract, so let's look at a scenario where using JSON to redefine our data structure not only makes sense, but illustrates the considerable power of JSON. Anytime we can create one truth and then drive multiple processes off of that one truth, you're better off than having multiple truths, which is what ends up happening in evolved and mature systems. To explain the one truth, Consider the following example. Johnny is given a specific grocery budget that allows him to buy four bananas each month, beginning in January. But Johnny only buys three because it turns out he doesn't really like bananas. Johnny's budget is changed so that beginning with February, he can buy four apples instead, but no more bananas. When Johnny went shopping in February, he bought five apples instead of four. Turns out that Johnny loves apples more than anything. Who'd have thunk? Johnny clearly needed more than four pieces of fruit, but too much of the same thing gets dull. So his budget was updated again, this time adding two pears and taking away one apple. This would go into effect in March. He still has no bananas in his budget, and though he can now buy pears, they were not on his budget before March. In March, Johnny buys three apples and two pears. He's finally on budget. This graph represents the tables we'll need for Johnny's budget. 
people, because Johnny's one of many people with their own budgets, fruit, of course, and fruit budgets. Johnny's fruit budgets look something like this. Four bananas in January, four apples in February, and so on. But we're going to receive invoices from the produce stand, so we'll also need an invoice table. Now we're ready. We receive our first invoice for three bananas purchased on January 13th, then another for three apples bought on February 5th, and a third for two apples picked up on February 15th. But wait, Johnny's overspent his apple budget. We don't see any problems with the invoices received for Johnny's March purchases, but something is wrong with the April invoice. Did Johnny actually buy a banana? How can we tell which invoices are okay to pay, which put Johnny over budget, and which may be invalid? Johnny's banana budget remains perfectly valid, but only for transactions in January. It's also true that Johnny had an apple budget that, for the month of February, would cover up to four apples. From March onward, Johnny has both a three apple and two pear budget. So what was true for January is only true for January and likewise for February. But what was true for March will remain true until it's replaced. So how do we reconcile what is and isn't valid for each of our invoices? And how do we know if Johnny is over or under budget? And for which periods? We could augment our simple schema with complex, multi-predicate relationships, perhaps with additional month-specific and or annual tables for summing expenditures. Or we could rely on queries. But most of our traditional models for date range-specific requirements perform poorly when scaled. If we opt instead for a JSON solution, we can create one source that contains all truths. January's truth, February's truth, and so on. With budget values updated as new budgets are added, and values such as spent and balance updated transactionally, we maintain one truth, and everything we need to know is included. Jason and I have formed a lasting and valuable friendship. Chapter 4. Why Virtual List Failed and I Had to Let a Good Friend Go Our story picks up with our billing clerk Casey from Chapter 2, who, for well over two years, blissfully ran her monthly state billing reports with little more than a button click. After reviewing each month's report, she saved it as a PDF and promptly submitted it for payment, at which point she was done with the state billing and could focus her attentions elsewhere. Those were the good old days. That was before the CFO started requesting quarterly and year-over-year -year comparisons of their monthly state billing totals. Now she could handle this initially by manually retrieving and comparing totals from those PDFs she'd saved of each submission. Then came requests from Al in accounting, who sometimes needed to research the contents of a prior submission so she could apply payment discrepancies to specific rows. And every now and then, Casey's supervisor, Kay, would ask her to reproduce an earlier report with minor changes, you know, like when it turned out that the original ID that had been provided to ISS for a participant turned out to be wrong. So although our virtual list met all of the original requirements, it didn't meet the evolving long-term needs. Now to be clear, this was not a problem with the virtual list itself. It's just that there are limitations to what we can solve with a virtual solution. So what was missing that caused our virtual list to fail? Permanence. You see, magic is temporary, which is perfectly okay for some applications, but as additional expenses were paid on behalf of participants, the amounts needing to be claimed for them would sometimes change. Now, when applicable, adjustment amounts were included on the next report, but attempting to rerun an earlier report became problematic because the virtual list always returned the current value, not the value as it was when originally submitted. The virtual list could only display one instance of the report at a time. The client's increasing desire to avoid accuracy issues or the need to submit adjustments at all led to them waiting at least 90 days before submitting their claims. Saved PDFs did allow Casey to access the originals when necessary, but this was an inelegant workaround. To meet all of the arising needs, a non-virtual design was needed. My new friend Jason had flexibility like virtual, 
But was JSON flexible enough to meet both the cover page and detail page requirements? Let's find out. Month specific summaries and grand total? Yes. Able to manipulate the data? Indeed. Nine row limit? No problem. Page level totals? Definitely. Month specific page constraint? Of course. Storable? Yes. Performant? Absolutely. The virtual list and I remain good friends, but I decided to see this challenge through with my new friend, Jason. Chapter 5, Replacing Virtual List with JSON for a Better Long-Term Solution. Every redesign begins with a thought process that must evaluate an inventory of existing and desired functionality with the new design elements and available tool sets in mind. I knew I could easily gather and store the data that was previously in variables, but how, specifically, would I organize it for long-term storage while still meeting the original requirements? And were there any additional improvements I should consider while I was at it? My thought process began at the end, thinking first about the end results on the cover and detail pages. The first table we needed seemed obvious to me, since a cover page summarizes the entire submission. And just as each record in our virtual list table represented a separate page, a state pages table could hold our page-specific data. Each row is essentially a join between the submission and a specific claim, so a claim submission table seemed appropriate. Records in this table would need to be created before the page records because we wouldn't know how many pages were needed until we knew how many rows we were working with across how many different months. For a variety of reasons, I also decided that the merging of build types should occur in the claim creation workflow that precedes building the report. Rather than leaving the task of positioning to unstored calcs and repetitions across dozens or hundreds of pages, I would instead predefine explicit page and row values for each claim. I would store the entire contents of a submission as JSON in the submission record. I would then build the individual page records where I would store all rows in a local page-specific JSON field. Then, from the context of the submission, I would capture and store the monthly sums in their own JSON. I concluded that transitioning from virtual to JSON would require schema additions to accommodate the stored objects, an updated workflow, new scripting for the report itself, and a few layout changes. Three new tables were added to support our JSON-based state billing, submissions, claim submissions, and state pages. The existing virtual list workflow included four user-initiated steps. The first step found all the participants with state-eligible costs. When this finished, Casey would verify the preliminary results using a traditional report. Then she would run a separate report of just the housing subsidies for accounting to verify. And from her found set of participants, she would then select Build State Form which built the virtual list and generated the state billing report in a matter of seconds. It was decided that with stored JSON-based results, the prelim and housing reports were redundant. So other than initiating the process, no additional user interaction was necessary. The entire sequence could be run server-side. The server-side workflow to prepare our submission would go like this. An existing subscript would run, building new state claims for any outstanding costs during the requested period, and from these results, claims for certain build types would be merged and converted to BSSD. We would then loop through the resulting claims to build our JSON and create the claim submission row records. Update the submission record with the JSON we'd built along with the page count and monthly sums, then add the page records, which would pull their own JSON directly from the submission. No longer working from a found set of participants and a popover located in the lower right corner of a dense, multi-purpose layout, Casey was given a dedicated workspace. To generate the monthly state billing, she would create a new submission record, enter the beginning and ending months for her report, then click Setup to kick it off. With the autocomplete option selected by default, each subprocess would run in sequence, and the completion of each step would be updated directly in the submission record, so Casey could easily check on the progress. She could also close and reopen the state billing window at any time. If autocomplete is turned off, each step is selected directly and runs locally, 
and tooltips attached to each step show start times and duration. When processing was complete, Casey could then open the report. And because the report is stored in its own record and opens in its own window, Casey could easily have multiple reports open simultaneously. These are the core steps in our Gather Claims script. This segment defines the positioning of each claim and builds both the JSON for the entire submission and for each individual claim row. After having created records for the claims that are being submitted, we sort our resulting found set of claim submissions as they are expected to appear on the report. Then we start a loop. For each record, we'll determine the page and row where this claim will appear on the report, and we update our JSON variable to include this claim's detail, after which we'll set the page, row, and claim-specific JSON into the claim submission record itself. After the loop is complete, we'll update the parent submission record, setting both the page count and JSON. So how are we defining the pages, rows, and JSON within that set variable on step 49? The first segment of our let statement defines and increments the major parameters of month, row, and page. This enforces the form rules of no more than nine rows per page, all belonging to the same month. The next segment defines the JSON addresses, or nodes, where the details belonging to this specific record will be stored. The last segment of our let statement defines the data points being captured for this record. Our result updates the JSON that will be stored with the submission using the addresses and data defined in our let. When we set the claim-specific JSON into our current claim submission record, we simply reuse the variables that were defined within our JSON building calc. On our layouts, our virtual list repeating fields were replaced by button bars, a feature that wasn't available when the virtual list version of this was first built. The context of our cover page is the submission record, and the button bars allow for up to 15 months per cover page. The cover page buttons calculate their values by evaluating a JSON months field in the submission record. The context for our detail page is the state pages table, where each of five nine-button bars pulls its value directly from the local JSON field. These are the calculations used by our button bars. On the cover page, the monthly description uses the native JSON list keys function in combination with a custom date formatting function. The monthly amount uses a JSON-related custom function to retrieve the month values and a formatting custom function for display. The grand total button returns the last value from JSON months. On our detail page, the row-specific participant name button pulls from the local state pages JSON field. The row-specific amount button returns the row's unit value multiplied by the state's fixed $10 unit rate. This is submission record 1044 for August 2019. It has a total page count of 165. And for reference, here's an example of the JSON months field from a submission with multiple months. If we look more closely at the formatted JSON, we can see that the data is organized by page, month, and row. This is the first of 165 state pages records belonging to submission 1044. If we look more closely at the formatted JSON, we can see that it contains only nine rows. We can also see that the data is organized by month and row. If this looks familiar, that's because this is pulled directly from the submissions JSON. Also, all rows on a page belong to the same month, and our state page record gets its month directly from the JSON. This is one of 1,480 claim submission records belonging to submission 1044. This particular record is the join to claim 2096100, and it can be found on row 2 of page 5. This is an actual cover page, and this is an actual detail page. The entire report can be recalled at any time, and the results will be exactly the same every time because it never needs to be rebuilt from scratch. Able to generate the state billing with minimal effort, freed up by the server-side processing that wasn't feasible for the temporary virtual list, and able to easily track the progress of a new submission, no longer concerned by requests from management or other departments since she's now able to update values at a claim row level on the rare occasion that this is necessary, and she has immediate access to historically accurate reports whenever they're needed, finally, 
She can even open multiple reports simultaneously, so our billing clerk, Casey, is extremely pleased with her new JSON-based state billing. In conclusion, the conversion from a virtual list model to a stored JSON-based model was a worthwhile effort because it delivered on both the original and newer requirements. It provided an opportunity for us to rethink the original problem in light of actual use experience, and it laid a foundation that will readily support future options. The Appendix. Make new friends, but keep the old. More virtual in JSON. I've included a number of virtual list examples, including the dynamically named virtual list fields and repeating virtual fields as used in our original report. I've also included a number of JSON examples for you to learn from and play with, including, of course, the JSON-based report from my story, Virtual versus JSON. Everything here can be found in the demo file, Virtual v JSON, which can be downloaded from har.fm slash heather all lowercase, please. Here you can build your own JSON-based report. There are several examples of varying sizes included for you to try. The names and other personal information has all been replaced with random data, but these are otherwise just like what we built for ISS. You'll also be able to check out how we used button bars for the final output. In the section titled Employees, you'll find several JSON examples, from the info display to JSON function demos, a dynamically built web viewer report, and even a budget validation and tracking example. You'll find all this and more after you've downloaded Virtual vJSON. Before I leave you to play, I'd like to call out some folks without whom my story would not have been the same. Special thanks to Bruce Robertson, the original virtual list inventor. To my illustrator, Lynette Sikora, who provided some levity for my predominantly technical tale. To Daisy Graves, who generously allowed me to include much of her JSON work from DevCon 2018 in my demo file, and to Jeremy Banty, who expanded my virtual horizons with his work on virtual value lists and virtual sorts. And finally, a very warm thanks to you for joining me as I shared my story, Making a New Friend, Virtual versus JSON. <laughs>